All right, everyone. Can I have your attention? We're going to get the final session for the symposium today started. Um, and it is my, my real pleasure to kick off this final session. Um, you know, many times when Farah is kind of needing some additional inspiration or guidance or trying to figure out um, how to do something new or looking for new ideas uh, for how to approach developing treatments, we look to other conditions. And oftentimes we look to um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy. And we look to what those patient organizations are doing, the research organizations. I attend some of the scientific conferences um, because there's a lot that we share in common, even though these are very different conditions. And as we begin to embark on gene therapies being developed in FA and having clinical trials come forward, this was a real opportunity, again, to really learn from, from our friends in the rare disease community. And so in thinking about how we continue to, you know, help you understand more about gene therapies and how they are maybe different from the other therapies that have come before and what might be important to consider related to participating in clinical trials, um, we decided to reach out to the SMA and DMD community and ask them to come and join us today to share their experiences and continue to help us on our journey. And so I'm really grateful for all of our panel participants today and for Kara Fick and Callan Madden on the FAIR team for pulling this together. Really thoughtful final session. So just a few things for kind of what, what we hope to accomplish in this session. Um, you know, like I said, we really want you to be able to learn from other patient family experiences. What are some of the important things to consider around decision-making about participating in gene therapy trials? How do you become informed about the risks and benefits? How do you make decisions, especially when it might involve you know, having to make compromises and changes? Um, what are the realities of gene therapy? Um, you know, we've talked about a cocktail approach and we do that very deliberately. Um, even gene therapies are not cures, even though it might sound like it in the title. And there are also going to be some important decisions to make even once therapies are approved. And it's been really exciting because there have been therapies now approved for spinal muscular atrophy and Duchenne. And I was really struck when I put this table together. So like I said, there's a lot we share in common. All three conditions were originally described in the mid to late 1800s. All of them had their, their genes identified around the same time. SMA and Duchenne are a little more prevalent than FA. So they're, they affect more people, but they are still rare diseases. SMA has early onset, typically in infancy. And prior to the approval of the current treatments, um, most children with SMA died before the age of two years of age. So it's very severe, very rapid progression. DMD is a little different. Um, average age of onset is four to five years of age. It affects boys mostly. And the manifestations are weakness of the skeletal muscle, but also a cardiomyopathy. Um, so like FA, it can affect multiple organ systems. It is progressive. And boys with Duchenne die from cardiomyopathy at an early age. Um, so there are some similarities, but you can see when you look at the target tissues, right, that are affected, um, one of the challenges we have in FA that I think has taken longer time for gene therapies to develop is needing to treat the brain specifically. 
So even though SMA is also a neurologic condition, the, the neurons that you need to get are actually more in the spinal cord. And they're much easier to target with gene therapies than FA, where we need to get to multiple regions in the brain and the spinal cord and the muscle and the heart. Um, so that's a little bit of context. Um, there have been approved small molecules now for each of these three conditions. Um, and there are also genetic approved therapies. And these genetic approved therapies are having profound effect, which is really exciting. And that's what you're gonna hear about um, from our panelists, as well as some of the challenges that they've experienced in their own families and in their community as these therapies get developed. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kara and ask her to help moderate our panel discussion. Such a uh, wonderful opening intro for us. My name is Kara Fick, and I joined FARA officially a little earlier this year on the patient engagement team. And I am absolutely honored to be helping to moderate this panel because we have a wonderful breadth of experiences participating as panelists today to share uh, their journeys with gene therapy. And while they're not in FA, I think there's so much that we can learn from those that are blazing the trail just a few steps ahead of us. Uh, so I want to get started by asking each of the panelists to just take maybe two minutes to introduce yourselves, tell us your name, where you're from, a little bit about your child and your experience with gene therapy and clinical trials. And I think if we move to the next slide, we should have some photos to share too. <laughs> Wonderful. Regina, if you want to get us started. I can grab that thing. Can you hear me? There we go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Regina Phillips. I am from Haddon Heights, New Jersey, which is South Jersey, right over the bridge from Philadelphia. Um, my son, Shane, who you can see in the pictures, is five and a half years old. Um, he has SMA type 2. He received gene therapy shortly after it was FDA approved, um, prior to any data being available on his age and size. So in the trials, it had been much younger, much smaller babies. And then when the FDA actually approved Zolgensma, which was the gene therapy, they approved it with a much broader label, um, all children to and under with no weight restrictions and no type restrictions. So we were faced with the decision on whether we get him dosed before he turned two, even though we had no available data. And we're actually about to begin another clinical trial uh, tomorrow, uh, which works directly on the muscles. Thank you. Okay. And next up we have Mindy. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Mindy Cameron. I've been a member of the Duchenne muscular dystrophy community for 20 years. I have a 22 year old son with Duchenne who's currently a college student living on his own with uh, full-time care. Um, he was diagnosed just before his third birthday. So I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, when we entered the space that we had no therapies. And I don't know how up to speed you all are on Duchenne, but we have six approved therapies now with a seventh to be potentially announced later this month. So I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of things go by the wayside. I've I've seen a lot of hope and a lot of, um, frankly, disappointment in the community. Um, I know a lot of a lot of disease groups look up to the DMD community as as being trailblazers, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, my own experience with gene therapy: my son has failed screening twice now for gene therapy. The first time he was uh, 16 years old, and his antibody titers were way too high, uh, just barely passed functional assessments. So. Um, fast forward six years ago, and we just failed screening again. Um, the gene therapy company that has an approved product in Duchenne was doing a small non-ambulant um, arm, and my son actually failed on three different criteria, um, functional assessment, mutation type, and uh, he is currently involved in another investigational trial. So we have failed screening twice and we are definitely representing the have nots which i i think every rare community will have the haves and the have nots so i'm here to talk about my experience with um how that feels and how to stay motivated and what what gene therapy could mean to these rare disease patients 
Thanks. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, next up, Sheila. Hi, um, my name's Sheila Unger, and thank you for having me. And um, I uh, come right after Mindy um, and after her, and not only in this presentation, but in um, a lot of ways. And I have a lot of gratitude to Mindy and uh, her son and the other folks like that who have come before me and my family um, in uh, Duchenne research and in the community. Um, but my name's Sheila, and I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, my son, Will, just turned 10 years old last week, um, and uh, he um, has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, almost five years ago, just before Christmas, in December 2018, Will was given the gift of being patient number one in Sarepta's gene therapy clinical trial at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and uh, at that time, he had just turned five. So um, we uh, have we had the very uh, real clinical trial experience that was outlined in some of the presentations below. Um, so we can talk a lot about those logistics and um, all our time in Columbus and how we're now big Ohio State fans. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, certainly, uh, last but not least, Amanda. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm M. Amanda Shirk um, from Skipback, Pennsylvania, about 30 minutes outside of where we are here today. Um, I have three children, a daughter and two sons. Uh, both of my sons have spinal muscular atrophy. Um, my older son, Billy, was diagnosed at 15 months old after he started displaying some symptoms of the disease. And um, he was eligible to receive gene therapy shortly after the FDA had approved the treatment, um, similar to what Regina said with Shane, where there was limited data on uh, babies, his size and his age. Um, but he received treatment at 19 months old. He is now um, five and a half, almost six, he'll be six in December. And he just started participating in a clinical trial for another treatment for SMA targeting the muscles. Um, and then my younger son, Leo, was diagnosed prenatally um, in order to get him gene therapy treatment as soon as possible, I was induced about two weeks early, um, and he was able to receive treatment at 17 days old, which timed up to be just a few days after what his original due date would have been. Um, and he did not have any symptoms at birth when he received treatment. Thank you all. Uh, so I think... All of us probably know that there are a lot of things to consider when it comes to clinical trials and when it comes to gene therapy clinical trials or gene therapy administration, there are maybe even more considerations. So things like if I'm taking an approved therapy, should I stop so that I can potentially receive gene therapy? What kind of safety data, if any, is available for this gene therapy if it's new? Um, who should I lean on to make this decision? Am I all alone or can I use some other resources? So in the case of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, I want to pose this next question to Mindy and Sheila um, and have you tell us a little bit more about how you made the decision to pursue a gene therapy clinical trial. And Sheila, maybe you can get us started and let us know a little bit about who you leaned on and how you made that decision. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> so I'm going to be reading and talking. <laughs> um, but um, we were, um, five years ago, we were, or more, we were coming from a unique situation um, at that time in that um, our firstborn son, Luke, had passed away from um, pediatric brain cancer. Um, so we had just really faced a rare disease um, out of nowhere in our house um, and uh, very uh, quickly and acutely and um, terribly, we lost our son. Um, and so needless to say, um, we were coming from a very unique perspective. Um, and about a year after Luke passed away, Will was diagnosed with Duchenne. And it was just another like um, totally unexpected thing that, that just kind of, uh, came at us out of nowhere. Um, and, uh, at that time though, we knew, um, you know, we had kind of, we were able to juxtapose the experience of Luke having really 
no options um, and uh, may maybe just some life prolonging thing interventions to a possibility of real hope for Will. Um, and so we um, knew too that we would do whatever it took to help him. And we had learned that, you know, if that's in America, maybe it's in China, maybe it's on the moon, um, we were willing to go anywhere to, to get Will help. Um, and so uh, thankfully through um, our sort of version, I guess, of, of FARA to a degree, a parent project muscular dystrophy, and um, Pat Furlong and uh, the team and community there, we were quickly and fortunately connected with um, Dr. Jerry Mandel um, nationwide. And um, honestly, um, we Will was four when we started screening and he, he was three when he was diagnosed and he was four when we were thinking about it. And it was just, um, we really trusted the team and the years and years of research that had gone into it. We had a trust of Pat and, um, we didn't have a lot of choices. Um, and so we didn't hesitate. Um, we took the opportunity as soon as it was available for Will. Um, in fact, we had hoped he was gonna be part of even a sooner trial, like a hospital-based kind of really small cohort. Um, and he was too heavy to be dosed for that one. Um, and so we were able to get him in just a few months later um, at, uh, at Nationwide. And so um, we did uh, not, um, question a lot. We uh, didn't hesitate and um, we just really trusted the experts and um, and were able to fortunately um, get that done. And, and he got the actual transfer when he was five. So um, that was, that's pretty much the, the background of that. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Sheila. And Mindy, you've had quite a bit of experience both personally, but also on the professional side with clinical trials. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how you've approached the decision to pursue a clinical trial with your son. Yeah, I think my son has a very unique mutation um, that had excluded him from any of the oligonucleotide trials. He's not really skippable. He's got a duplication mutation. So because he had an unusual mutation, I was a real searcher. I was a, I'm a journalist by training. And for the past 20 years, I just dove headfirst into anything that was coming into the Duchenne space as far as research. Because I, th I think partly because I'm inquisitive, but partly because nothing else was available to him. So when he, he, he uh, I learned a lot about gene therapy. I worked in the gene therapy field. When an opportunity came and we screened and failed, I really, it was like getting the diagnosis over again for me. I had had so much hope in that one thing. And I had been so focused on gene therapy that when he, when he screen failed, I went and did something else for about 18 months, uh, went to work in another field, um, and then really thought this is where I belong. And so I, I came back, um, as far as so many, so many commonalities that I've learned today, it's, it's hard to know where to start, but you know, we, we do have, our gene therapy kids are accepted into trials with a background therapy of steroids, just like I, I assume you're going to have with Skylaris. So that's one commonality. Um, you know, this this idea of already being involved in an investigational trial and getting the opportunity to do something else is a very interesting one. It's happening a lot in our community. Um, my son is older. He's heavier. We've had uh, we have had two deaths in our gene therapy programs in Duchenne. So that's always top of mind. Is he too old? Has, has he got not enough muscle mass to, to rescue? Um, I'm not sure what we would have done if we had gotten into the second opportunity. We didn't, so I didn't have to think about it. One thing I do know is I'm pretty happy it's really his choice now. I think parents are making these very difficult decisions for their kids before they're 18. And sometimes those are pretty risky. It's really something to consider. Thank you. Now, in the case of SMA, uh, it's a little bit different. So Amanda and Regina, uh, there was a therapy approved in 2016 for SMA, as Jen mentioned, called Spinraza. And I think both of your children were taking that therapy after they were diagnosed. And then a gene therapy was approved a couple years later, and you had to make the decision to stop this therapy that you had been using and seemed to be working well and pursue an unknown gene therapy. Um, so even though your experiences were after a uh, gene therapy was approved, there was still a lot that was unknown at that point. 
So I would love for each of you to talk a little bit about just how you made that decision and how you weighed those uh, different options. Uh, Regina, maybe you want to get us started. Sure. So I had uh, touched on this a bit in my intro in that um, the trials for Zolgensma, which is the gene therapy for SMA, were all much younger, much smaller babies. And no one really knew that the FDA was going to take a broader approach and allow it to be given to any child under two. So I didn't even know that I would be faced with such a wonderful decision. And it's not lost on me that most rare disease, disease families don't have an option of treatment. So um, what a wonderful problem to have, right? Um, my son was a delayed diagnosis. He probably should have been diagnosed at five or six months. And unfortunately, we did not get a diagnosis until 10 and a half months. And over that short amount of time, he lost an incredible amount of motor function. So we felt like we were in a huge deficit. And we were trying to do the best we could for him with the information available to us at the time. So of course, I had the trials to look at and how those younger patients did. But um, his own neuromuscular doctor could not even give an opinion as to whether we should stop the existing treatment, Spinraza, only to take a gene therapy that we had no idea if it would ever work on someone his size and his weight. Um, she said because there was no data, she could not give us an opinion one way or the other. Um, so I'm an attorney by trade. Uh, I'm used to researching. <laughs> um, I was like, what information is out there that I could possibly review that could help me make this decision aside from talking to the doctor who really couldn't give me much. And aside from talking to some other families, which I did, um, families who were in the trials. Uh, so I started looking into the literature from the primates and I read that there was a three-year-old primate dosed. Um, and after the aut autopsy of the primate, it was discovered that the gene had in fact made it into every cell of that primate's body. So effectively, the drug did what it was supposed to do. It had gotten to every cell and it had, do it had dropped a working copy of the missing gene. And just to give some background on how SMA works, um, individuals with SMA are missing a gene that creates a protein to keep the motor neurons alive and they have a number of backup copies of that gene that are broken. They're spliced. So they make some good protein, a lot of bad protein. So the existing treatment he was on worked on that broken backup copy to patch it and try to get better protein out of it. But I knew that Zolgensma replaced the primary gene that we create arguably all the protein needed for the motor neurons to live. So after looking at the primate studies, after understanding that the mechanism of this drug would hopefully work better than the existing drug, and after speaking with the mother of the child in the trials who had gone into liver failure, um, and her saying to me, I would do it again if I had to, of course, he did make a recovery, um, and they did change the parameters for how to monitor the liver after the dosing, we decided that we would take the risk and we would go forward with it. Yep. So similar to Regina just explained with Shane, my son, Billy, um, was also um, on Spinraza. He, when he was diagnosed at 15 months, he um, had already, he progressed very, very quickly, lost the ability to, um, to roll over, to reach his arms to his mouth, to feed himself when he was sitting in his high chair. Um, when he was sitting, he would, he would fall over. Um, so we, on Spinraza, we already started to see some gains. He got some of those skills back and about a month into his Spinraza treatment, the FDA approved this wider label of gene therapy. So we were faced with the same problem of, you know, what do we do? There's a, another treatment available that, um, could be better, um, so again, it's a great problem to have, but it did beg the question of, do we, do we give up something good, something that we know that's working for potentially something better when there's very limited data available? Um, so we leaned on uh, what we could. Um, the doctors were able to give us very limited information, but we took whatever pieces that we could get to help make our decision. We spoke with other patient families. Um, we had people from Cure SMA that we we really just got every opinion that we could to help us. Um, the other thing that we looked at is what is the quality of life for our son with Spinraza. Um, he would need to get a spinal injection, go under anesthesia, lay flat for a period of time and be monitored every four months for the rest of his life. 
Whereas with the gene therapy, it was going to be a one-time IV infusion dosed, um, you know, over a, a short period of time, monitored for a short period of time, and that's it. We, you know, the treatment part will be done. Um, so ultimately, between the research that we did and talking with other families, it really was a gut feeling of this feels good. Let's go ahead. Let's pursue it. And we also knew that we potentially had the option to go back to Spinraza should we need to um, if the gene therapy did not um, give us any results. So we decided to pursue it. And at 19 months old, um, he got Zolgensma treatment. So as we can see, there's a lot of things that go into the equation about, should I get gene therapy or not? It's not a very simple answer. Um, and so I think it's great to hear from people who um, sometimes it comes down to basic eligibility criteria. Sometimes it comes down to leaning on uh, some of the experts that you may know, and maybe sometimes they can't weigh in. Um, when there's preclinical data available, uh, I think it's it's great to be able to look into that. And then, of course, quality of life is a big piece of the equation, too. So many things to think about. Um, as Mindy mentioned, uh, in the Duchenne muscular dystrophy community, there have been a couple of deaths in their gene therapy trials. And so with any clinical trial, there are risks and there are real risks to gene therapy. So it's extremely important to be very well informed about um, what is involved in the clinical trial? Uh, what are the risks? What are the commitments? And are you able to make those commitments and are they right for you? So um, I would like to ask Mindy to begin if uh, she has any advice for us on ways to gather this very important information when making a decision about uh, potentially joining a gene therapy clinical trial. So first of all, I, I did not know about this. This is all I think this is in everybody's folder. This is the best resource I've ever seen about clinical trial information. So I highly encourage you all to read this. I'm taking it. I'm stealing it. Um, I don't know who does your slides and your, and your stuff, but it's quite good. Shout out to Maureen over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is really excellent. So there's a ton of information about terminology and what to expect, what to ask. Um, the only thing that I would really add, I work for a company that does design clinical trial protocols and um, a lot of digitized uh, clinical trial tools. Um, I would ask to do an e-consent, an electronic consent, or I would at least get to a copy of the consent and take it home and live with it for a however long you need. I know sometimes you're in a situation where you have to make a decision, but take that document, study it. Don't feel pressurized. Don't wait till you get to clinic to where you're going to feel a lot of pressure. You're going to feel anxiety. Your child may be acting out. Who knows what may happen when you're at the trial site. So I suggest you ask for that consent beforehand, study it, share it with your, with your primary care doctors, share it with your care team. Um, Share it with your your loved ones, uh, your extended family, your lawyers. I don't I don't know, but get comfortable with that document because you know this is an informed consent. And once you sign it, you are giving consent. And these gene therapies are one time treatments. Um, I always like to make a list, a pros and cons list. I like to see it in front of me and really because you do forget about things, you forget about considerations. It's a huge decision. So anything that you can do to to compartmentalize what, what your thoughts are and really study it. Um, make sure you very are very aware of the, the study schedule. You are making a commitment as well as the sponsor, as well as the clinic. This is also your responsibility to stay in that study and do what you have agreed to do, whether that's long-term follow-up, whether that is going having to move to another city for a short period of time, whether it means traveling back and forth, be sure you're very comfortable with what you're committing to do. And, you know, ask questions. If you have a question about anything, anything, ask. Thank you, Minnie. Some really great advice in there. And for anybody who does not have a copy of our clinical trials packet, you can find it on FARA's website or you can find a hard copy out uh, at the registration table out front. It's also been translated into, I don't know how many different languages at this point, a whole bunch. Um, so it's uh, available for anyone really around the world. Cause I know we have some international um, attendees watching virtually today. Uh, it's a great resource. Thank you, Mindy. 
Uh, Sheila, you said that you were patient number one in the Sarepta gene therapy clinical trial. And so I'd love to hear from you a little bit about um, you know, some of the unknowns, like you didn't know if your son was going to receive placebo or gene therapy. Uh, you, the, the study staff didn't know the best way to even make the gene therapy work while he was receiving it. Um, and maybe just some of the logistical things that had to um, be taken into consideration when you were participating. Yeah, um, gosh, it's it's wild because I honestly look back at it all so fondly. And we really kind of consider the all of our caretakers and the the whole team in Ohio kind of our Ohio family. Um, but um, you know, we we knew um that we knew there were risks. We did, we just dove in. We didn't hesitate. Um, but we also did know it was a big commitment. And I guess, um, thankfully, and and you mentioned things aren't lost on on us in a lot of ways. And it's not lost on me that uh, we were fortunate in that um, Will was young and didn't have a job or school that he had to leave. Um, my younger son was. Uh, two and a half at the time. And then um, I was actually pregnant. Um, so that was easy to carry around. <laughs> um, but um, so I knew though, um, that we were going to be spending time in Columbus. And so it was very clear, kind of like this, one of the slides that was shown earlier regarding some of the trials uh, that are coming up for FA. Um, we did have to stay, we knew we had to stay in Columbus for a month. We couldn't even leave the state if we wanted to. Um, we did have a death in the family and we didn't leave Ohio for the funeral even. Um, I had I just remembered that today. Um, but we just, um, we, we had to stay in Ohio. Um, and uh, we stayed for a Christmas one year and a Thanksgiving the next year. Um, and um, I, I wrote my things. I want to make sure I don't miss anything. We had over 15 visits per year in the first two years of the study. Um, and so we usually drove um, like seven to eight hours to Columbus. So that was well over 30 times through the, the five years that we've been involved in the trial. Um, but um, the, and interestingly too, during COVID, I, I kind of joke, but um, it, at the time during, during COVID, my only one parent was allowed to go. And so it was actually kind of a nice bonding time for my husband and my son or vice versa, you know, kind of going and doing our um, trips to Ohio to see our muscle doctors. Um, thankfully though, we had tremendous support from family and friends and you guys may already know this, you probably do, but it continues to surprise me. And, um, I'm just filled with gratitude at how so many people do end up coming through for you, whether it's sending little things to you at your Ohio apartment or, um, just mowing your grass or whatever, babysitting your dog, um, those kinds of things. So we really are fortunate that we had that. And most of all, that my husband was able to work remotely from Ohio. So I didn't have to be there alone with Will. I know a lot of other families in the trial um, might've had two boys uh, in the trial. And so they actually had to divide. Those boys couldn't be near each other because of the uh, antibodies. And, and we didn't, you don't know if you're getting placebo or the real transfer. So um, there were a lot of factors that made it easier for us. Um, the uh, logistics just weren't a point of hesitation for us. Um, and we got a lot of support, I have to say, from Sarepta. I mean, the, the travel and the facilitation that they do with all that is incredible. Um, financially, you're supported. Um, so it's in those ways, they make it really easy. Um, knowing that what you're doing is not only hopefully going to help your son a ton, um, but it's also just paving the way for who knows what. Um, and so um, the the when he did the actual transfer, um, the, the it was it was really not invasive. He was so he was five, and so the biggest deal was putting the IV into his arm, and um, for him not being able to see the TV screen <laughs> um, during the actual ninety minute infusion, people kept getting in his way, uh, but he couldn't see the movie. Um, but I mean, truly, it was just that uneventful. There were like 10 to 15 people in the room, um, including a lot of key researchers, our doctor. He actually had his wife um, on the premises because it was that special and like this much of a big deal. Um, and so it felt like a big deal in that way. But for Will, it really wasn't um, invasive. And uh, they were, uh, Kara alluded a little bit, they weren't sure, I mean, and I, I don't know if they are sure yet of the uh, the best way to go about it, but they kept moving his body on a timer. So every few minutes they would move his legs and just kind of, and then they would move his arms and then they'd have him move his legs and him move his arms and have him sit up and then have him lay down with the idea of having some blood circulation, I guess would be 
beneficial, but it was definitely like, um, not, you know, not the most <laughs> scientifically based, but maybe it will be uh, based on what happened with Will. Um, but, um, and then the other thing that's important to mention is all of the follow-up that we did um, afterwards, which we were happy to do. Um, just like, you know, when something, certainly when it helps you, and even when it doesn't, um, you recognize your contribution to science. Um, and so we were really adamant about being committed. We really wanted to be like A plus clinical trial students. Um, and so I remember even emailing, I was looking a couple in the past few days, emailing every time Will lost a tooth or every time he, you know, had a little kid thing, he broke his arm. Um, and, and we, you know, are immediately on the phone calling. So you definitely um, are diligent about reporting that and being as thorough as possible so that they have all the information. And thankfully for Will, um, that also was pretty uneventful. I think that there were some increased liver enzymes at a time. We were blinded. Um, and I was just joking with Mindy about the, the toggle between ignorance is bliss in a clinical trial and knowledge is power. Because sometimes it's nice to not have to worry about all the, the details and just to, um, you know, just see how he's doing. And what we saw with our eyes was amazing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we just um, did the whole you know, it was a long time, but, um, and it's still ongoing. So, but it was worth it. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, your commitment to those follow-up visits and to your reporting, I'm sure was extremely important in the overall trial. So, um, that's an important takeaway for anybody who's going to participate in a clinical trial of any sort, um, including a gene therapy clinical trial to make sure you can continue those visits and continue to report anything that you see so that the data is full. So thank you for being such a good student, Sheila. <laughs> now, Regina and Amanda, uh, your sons received gene therapy after it was approved. So maybe there weren't 10 to 15 people in a room moving them around like a, like a puppet. Um, but it'd be nice to hear uh, what your experience was like, and um, especially from Amanda, who had two children cheated. So um, as I mentioned before, because now we had the option to receive gene therapy, we were very uh, excited about that. Um, I think the hardest part of the process that day was getting the IVs. He was a big, chunky baby, so getting the IVs um, into him. But um, after coming from a treatment where he was under anesthesia, he had all of this monitoring to the day that he received treatment um, was actually very, I say, anticlimactic. Um, you know, you're about to receive this multi-million dollar treatment, one of the most expensive drugs that the FDA has ever approved. And I remember the nurse walking in um, with a, a bag that looked no different than the bag of saline that he was getting. And it was like, oh, this is this is it. Um, but he was infused over the course of an hour. He was playing with toys. He was eating snacks. Um, we wouldn't even know that anything was happening. Um, they had monitored him for a few hours afterwards. Um, and really overall, the process was very simple. Um, he did spike a fever a few days after when we were home. Um, it was very mild, didn't last for more than 24 hours. Um, and he did, because of elevated liver enzymes, he was on steroids for a longer period of time than expected. Um, it was about three and a half months after he received the gene therapy that he needed to be on the steroid. Now with um, you know, comparing from that to Spinraza, it was even very simple, um, but even more so when my son Leo got the treatment at 17 days old, uh, it was even more simple. And part of it, I'm sure, is because we've done this before. We knew exactly what to expect. We knew what we were walking into. Even, you know, we knew where to park. We knew where to go. All of those little logistics that might seem overwhelming the first time around. But um, through the hour infusion, he slept right through the whole thing. He had a feeding. He was monitored for a couple of hours. We went home. He did not spike a fever after, had no symptoms whatsoever. Um, when he was on the steroid post-treatment, it was for about a month that he was on it. He was able to wean off after that. And by eight weeks, he was completely done. So he followed the course exactly how he was supposed to. Um, and there was no issues or concerns at all. I feel as though your story about Billy could be identical to my son, Shane. He also got the gene therapy the same age, um, 19 and a half months, very anticlimactic like Amanda described. I mean, I recall him eating a banana 
playing with toys. The IV was probably the most difficult part. I remember more the nurse who was bringing the medicine almost having a panic attack <laughs> because it was $2.1 million in her hand. And I'm asking her, did it come in a gold box? What does the box look like? And they wouldn't give it to me, but <laughs> she was more worked up than anybody else, which I can totally understand. Um, afterwards, my son spiked a fever as well. Have to remember with gene therapies, it's a viral vector that your body still has to process. It's very difficult on the liver. Um, my son's liver enzymes were also elevated. He was on steroids for an extended period of time, three months. And I do think it affects the older and larger individuals more significantly because the dose is weight-based. So they get a larger dose than the smaller kids. Um, but overall, I mean, we had to do some extra blood work monitoring for his enzymes. But after 89 days, I don't know, I was counting because the steroids were a little bit rough. That was the most difficult part, 89 days of steroids that made him a little cranky. Um, and honestly, we did one night in the hospital because of the fever that was spiked, but that was just a precaution because I don't think it had happened before in the trials, but he was totally fine after that. And maybe I should, maybe I'll mention with Duchenne, they, they live on steroids pretty much constantly. So they were, they were adjust, they adjusted the steroids and increased it, but they, they had, we had to be on a baseline of a certain amount of steroid. Um, and then it was raised and lowered variously. So just in case, I don't know how that plays out. Um, but that's just was one slight difference. I've heard that you, you know, you really, some, you can consider gene therapy, almost like an organ transplant and having to tamp down that immune response mm -hmm. during a therapeutic window. So I, I think that there's a little bit of a little bit of crossover knowledge about treating this like an organ transplant almost. Mm. Thank you all for sharing uh, your experiences there. Uh, so the way that we know that gene therapy is supposed to work, um, we know that there is great potential for gene therapy as a treatment to target the root cause of a genetic disease. Uh, but it's also not necessarily an instantaneous magic cure. Um, and we've talked a lot today about all of the things that led you all up to uh, pursuing gene therapy or receiving it. Um, but I'm sure everybody in this room is curious to know now how your children are doing after the gene therapy. So I'd love to hear about um, some of the impacts that you've seen, uh, if you've had to manage any expectations along the way, and just how, how the kiddos are doing now. Um, Regina, you want to get us started? Sure. Um, one of the things that we've heard a lot in the SMA community is that they will never get back anything that they lost. And that's really proven to not be true. Um, so my son, for example, I told you he was a late diagnosis. Unfortunately, by the time he was diagnosed, he had lost all function in his legs. He couldn't lift his arms past here. Um, you could put him in a seated position, but if he moved in any direction, he would fall over. Um, he was really... It, the disease had started to ravage his body in such a short amount of time. Um, so although he had not yet had any breathing or eating impairments, which is very common in SMA, um, he was probably well on his way. And motor function wise, the doctor said he had the motor function of a newborn to a three month old at 10 and a half months of diagnosis. Um, so after gene therapy, you know, our hopes were that he would improve, but even if he had just remained the same and not continued to decline, we would have been happy. He had improved a little bit on Spinraza, but I'll never forget seven days after the gene therapy, we had him laying on the ground where normally he wouldn't move. And all of a sudden he just started rolling across the whole room on his own. And it's just tears, you know, something that you would never imagine happening, something so simple as a roll. Um, and to happen so quickly within a week was just unbelievable. But what, you know, what is meaningful treatment? What is meaningful gains? For some people, it might be you know, being able to swallow without choking, maybe being able to breathe without BiPAP support for a certain period of time. For kids that are a little bit stronger when they're dosed, maybe it's uh, taking steps with some assistance, um, you know, sitting up on their own. It, it, it varies. And we were never expected to have a cure. We didn't think that all of the symptoms would immediately go away because we knew how much motor, motor neuron damage had occurred by the time he was diagnosed. Um, but really, what's the value of quality of life? I think anything that can improve somebody's independence is worthwhile. Um, I think even for $2.1 million, it's worth it to me to see my son now able to do a lot of things independently. He uses a manual wheelchair. Um, he's starting to be able to stand with bracing and take steps with assistance. So the sky's the limit and we'll never give up. 
thank you. And it's amazing to hear how, how quickly you saw some of those effects take yeah. place. Um, Amanda, you want to share next? So one of the things that I think um, with Billy that we are so fortunate for is the timing of his diagnosis and the timing where we started to see some of his decline. He had the Spinraza right away. And with like while he was still doing his loading doses of that treatment, he then received gene therapy right after just because of the timing of um, his progression and the timing of the approval. And with the Spinraza, we started to see the small gains. But as Regina just said to you with the gene therapy, it was immediate that we saw things. The same, Billy was rolling across the room all of a sudden. He was bearing weight on his legs. Um, he was able to lift his arms all the way up over his head. Um, within, it was four months after treatment that he was able to cruise along furniture and started to bear some weight in his arms. Eight months after treatment, he started crawling. Um, and 10 months after treatment, um, it was May 2020, he started taking his first steps, which is a milestone that was never promised to us um, and something that we will be forever grateful for. And to this day, he continues to um, make gains. Um, you know, this year he took the school bus to school um, and he does have an aide to help him get up those big steps, but he can do it and we're working on it. Um, so I think we're very, very fortunate for just how everything played out and how quickly um, he got treated in comparison to the time that he started losing some of his abilities. Um, for my son, Leo, he, with him being treated, um, right away in the trials, the babies who were treated pre-symptomatically at birth, um, some of them, you don't even know, you wouldn't even know that they had the disease. So we're very hopeful that we'll see that. Um, Leo's only five months, but he's rolling over. He just started sitting up. He's meeting all of his milestones right on time. So there's no reason not to be hopeful. Then we'll see what happens in the next couple of years for him. Thank you. And Sheila, how about you and your son, Will? Gosh, I don't know if y'all just saw my eyebrows and jaw drops when she was talking. That's how our doctors look when they see Will. <laughs> um, they, uh, doctors and um, nurses and the whole team. Um, and I wrote, the effects for Will have been jaw dropping. <laughs> um, he's been able to do so much that we didn't think was going to be possible for him. Um with Duchenne, there's a there's a range as with all of this as as to the onset. But when he was young, you know, before gene therapy, he couldn't jump on two feet and he couldn't run. Um, but he he was growing more and more unsteady and um, falling and just having those. It was just a really nerve wracking life experience being on the playground. If you can imagine how much preschoolers touch each other, you know, um, how much they fall down and how much they bonk each other. Um, and so he uh, was unsteady um, and he just needed a little bit more help than most four and five year olds with uh, brushing his teeth well or getting his shirt on and, and getting dressed. Um, but really almost immediately after the gene therapy, and uh, just like you guys, I'll never forget. And for us, it was at Christmas time, which made it even more memorable in a way. Um, but uh, everything changed. Um, he became more steady. He wanted to run. He wanted to race. Um, he was pretty much able to run. Um, and he was jumping. Um, he was upside down on the couch, uh, doing rolling down hills, things that take a lot of strength that... Um, a lot of people take for granted in young children, but that we had never seen well do. Um, and uh, he just, he fell less. He um, played in ways that I think are just, you know, how important is it for your brain when you're a little kid to be able to, to cross over and play and reach for a train and reach for a truck behind you and that kind of meaningful play um, for your body. Um, Will was able to play um, non-adapted sports, um, which, when you hear, when you say that to Dushan folks, that he played um, baseball and tennis and golf and soccer and was on a swim team for three years and swam alongside peers that don't have Dushan, um, that is unheard of um, and, uh, and so remarkable. Um, and he did a great job and he enjoyed every minute of all of that. Um, Soon after, uh, I think this is something that I always like to mention is um, a couple months after the gene therapy, I overheard him talking to his little brother and Will goes, Adam, remember when my legs used to hurt all the time? 
like the two-year-old would really remember, but <laughs> Will felt that he might. And um, and Will goes, they don't hurt anymore. And um, his life was not driven by Duchenne for the past five years. Um, it's just what that has meant to his confidence and his sense of identity, um, his social skills and his ability to be a part of a team and a part of things as a young boy. Um, and he, to this day, we had our most recent visits back in, I guess it was June. And um, still you get a lot of, wow. And oh my gosh, he's doing so well. Um, and uh, he also rides the bus and climbs the steps to the bus, um, carries his lunch tray by himself um, and uh, is able to go out to the playground at recess and um, play tag. So these are things that are just so, um, amazing, and we don't take any one of them for granted. Um, we don't know what tomorrow holds. None of us do, obviously, ever. Um, and uh, we are always like trying to learn now how to stay on top of uh, research and what else is out there and what else is coming around um, because we have been in the trial and um, we haven't had to keep our eye on that as much. Um, but now we're, we're just saying, hey, we need to still um, make sure that we're aware of what's around the corner. And, and um, But so far, so good. And um, I just want to say here uh, that I just am so thankful to Sarepta and to Pat Furlong and Dr. Mandel and Kelly Lehman and um, all these, the whole uh, team, every nurse we've had out at Nationwide, um, just to give us this chance for Will to have, um, just be a, a typical normal boy um, for the past five years. Thank you all for sharing that experience. That's wonderful. And, uh, you know, as we can hear, the effects of gene therapy can be variable uh, person to person, but I'm so happy to hear that each of our panelists have seen impacts from their gene therapy that was meaningful to them. And I hope that that continues. In case he ever sees this, I don't, I shouldn't say normal. He's outstanding. I mean, he's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> he's more than normal. <laughs> so Mindy, you have been involved in the Duchenne community for quite some time. Uh, you've seen things evolve in the Duchenne world over the 20 years since your son was diagnosed. Uh, I know that he has participated in a lot of research and your family has really helped to lay a lot of the groundwork for where Duchenne is now. Um, so can you start to close out our panel by sharing a little bit about some of the progress you've seen over your journey um, and any advice or words that you can share with our FA community, many of whom are in the same shoes as you? Yeah, I've really, I've really resonated. A lot of what I've learned today has really resonated with me. Again, um, we have a lot of commonalities. We have some differences. Um, we have too many, well, not too many. We have an amazing assortment of pediatric trials and not enough adult trials. And I understand from today that you have the opposite. <laughs> so that is one, um, one big difference. Um, you know, we didn't, used to have a life expectancy much beyond 2021 in Duchenne, and now we've bumped that into the 30s. That's not just because of, of like therapy research. That's a lot to do with standards of care. Um, we do have a patient population that is quite disabled, and they are their, dis their disability is lasting longer. We have a lot of caregiver concerns, um, supports and services. So much I've learned here we have in common. Um, I think things to, to keep on the horizon as you get more and more therapies, congratulations on your first one. And it seems to me like you've got some others coming in pretty quick succession with any luck at all. So be, be careful of the word cure. I think so many organizations use that word and um, I don't think we're there yet for any, for many of these diseases, maybe SMA is. Yeah. I, you know, SMA is interesting. Um, so you're going to have the haves and the have nots, and you need to support the have nots because it's very difficult to be left behind. And you'll have a division in your community. Um, you'll have young families that don't necessarily want to see older patients, and you'll have older patients that don't necessarily want to see younger patients. Uh, organizations advocacy is, is going to change, but there's always going to be needs that need to be filled. There's a role for everyone. 
Um, so I think community members and community leaders should try to manage expectations about what these therapies are and what they are not, um, who they can help and who they cannot. Um, one other thing we've had, uh, we've come up against in Duchenne is we have a hard time enrolling all of our clinical trials. And that's a great thing. We have so many clinical trials, but we also have a lot of parents holding out because they want the gene therapies. They want the dystrophin replacing therapies. They want those trials. They don't necessarily want to get involved in downstream, like uh, symptom uh, trials that are addressing the symptoms of the disease. So that's a challenge. Um, a lot of our patients age out for either an age cap or an ability cap. So enrolling all your clinical trial pipeline will become more challenging as more and more therapies come online. You'll have less patients to choose from. People will have treatments on board. So that's something that you should probably be preparing for. And lastly, uh, I was a parent that put all my focus and energy, you know, 20 years later, I'm still doing it. Um, Maybe I wasn't so great at living in the present all the time because I was so focused on saving him. When you get these diagnoses, they can seem like death sentences and they are not. I think you saw my family in the pictures. We have had a, a fantastically full life, full of laughs and love and travel and adventure and uh, goodwill from strangers. It is not a death sentence. It's it's something different than you might have imagined, but live in the present as much as you can. Uh, ther therapies and treatments are out there; they're on the horizon. But you can't you can't become obsessed with them. You have to learn how to live with it. Find supports, find services. I have a lot of ideas about that. If anybody wants to talk to me, I don't know how engaged your community is with finding state supports and services. But I think from what I've read and seen today. There are a lot of young um, adults out there with FA that that could be living pretty independently with some some help. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, I want to invite Jen to come back up to the stage for uh, some closing remarks for us. But uh, as she's making her way up here, I figured you would do that. <laughs> uh, as Jen is making her way up here, um, I, I hope that everybody has been able to take away a couple of nuggets from our panelists. I want to thank them with so much sincerity from the bottom of our hearts for sharing your lives, sharing your stories, sharing your insights with us. Uh, as I mentioned, I really think that there's a lot that we learn from those that are blazing the trail just a few steps ahead of us. And that's really you. So thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to thank all the ladies for coming and sharing their story. And especially my heart goes out to you, Mindy, too. Um, I just wondered as a matter of, well, interest, is is the Duchenne boy who had the uh, your son, um, Sheila, your son, is he still on the steroids? And are the other two boys with the SMA, are they on the spirosa still? Um, yes. He he is still on the steroids. He's on a um not like the the standard of care dosing. They haven't yeah. increased it weight wise um as much as I think they would have otherwise. Um, and I think the hope is is that eventually those could become unnecessary. Um, but for now they're still on board. Yeah. So we were forced um, to stop the Spinraza. The insurance company would not continue to pay for Spinraza and pay for gene therapy. Um, they're very expensive drugs, and that's what we're going to run into in all of these rare disease communities. However, there was a third therapy approved about a year after the gene therapy called EVRSD. It works in the same way as Spinraza, but it's orally dosed or G-tube if you don't have the um, ability to swallow. Um, and I did fight for that all the way to the last level of the insurance company uh, outside agency review. It took about six months, but we got it approved. So my son has been on the oral therapy, Everest D, which is very similar to Spinraza, um, since about, I guess, two years now, almost three. Um, and the thought is that that combination treatment, because one works on the, the main gene and the other one works to patch that backup gene, you know, the more protein, the better in terms of the severely symptomatic children like my son. 
So he is on a second therapy now. And that is a consideration with the high cost of these gene therapies. And then the Everest D treatment is actually $7,777 <laughs> per pound of person capped, wow. capped at 350,000 a year. So what, what we're we're capped out now with his size and his uh, so th the insurance is paying three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year at any given time two bottles of Everest DR in my refrigerator at a cost of about twenty eight thousand dollars. It's not cheap. <laughs> Thank God for insurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so neither of my sons are on any other treatment. Once they got the gene therapy, they stopped, um, or well, my older son stopped Spinraza and hasn't received anything else other than the clinical trial that he just started participating in about two weeks ago. Um, and I, the other clinical trial, what is, what is that for? And what, what other clinical trials are you now getting involved in for, like, what's the, what's the next step? What's the rationale behind that? Yeah, so I can take that. The existing treatments are all SMN upregulators. So they're, they're meant to target the protein production in the body. This trial that Billy's already on and my son is about to start tomorrow is a myostatin inhibitor. So myostatin is an enzyme that's secreted by the muscles in the body. And the thought is by suppressing the myostatin, the muscle will be allowed to grow faster and um, larger in a shorter amount of time. Um, so there's actually two trials going on right now. One is a monthly infusion for the drug, and the one that Billy and my son are about to start is a weekly at-home injection. Um, but they both do the same thing. They're myostatin inhibitors. And it was actually trialed in Duchenne. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, it was determined to be safe but not effective. Um, and so Bristol Myers Squibb sold it to Biohaven and re -re repackaged it to try an SMA. And that's what's good about this rare disease community too. I mean, of course, unfortunate that it was not successful in DMD, but these drug companies are making discoveries on top of one another. The gene therapy that I believe is available for DMD now was created after the gene therapy for SMA by the same doctor, Dr. Jerry Mendel. So there's a lot of interrelatedness in the treatments. Yeah, they were being developed concurrently. Yeah, I remember the fact that the SMA treatment came online before the DMD treatment just blew me away. Because we had it seemed like we had been working on it for decades, and then here comes SMA. But you know, Duchenne, the 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 protein that causes DMD is is huge. It's one of the largest known in the body, and juxtapose that with the frataxin gene and the SMA gene, and it's it's a little bit easier to deal with. It's easier to package in a vector. We have to use a micro or a mini dis, uh, dystrophin, so we're not getting the whole protein. So in DMD, this isn't curative; it's a treatment. I think there was another question. Uh, Kyle said that his question was answered. Okay. So, uh, I do have one. I think it was Mindy. I think it was you that mentioned the similarities in the Duchenne and FA hearts, uh, the heart condition. Uh, I don't remember if anyone mentioned any impact on the heart with these various therapies in, in the Duchenne community. Uh, have any I would say we're waiting on that data. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, maybe I'll I'll take um, just a few minutes to kind of wrap up. Again, thank you all so much for sharing your personal experiences and your family um, with all of us. And you know, you've you've inspired, I think, a lot of us as well. Um, and we've talked a lot about advantages and disadvantages of gene therapies. And one of the things that excited me when we had our planning meetings was hearing that this one and done might might be solvable in the near future. The fact that your children are getting approved gene therapy products and other therapies on top of them is incredibly exciting to me. Um, and the fact that, you know, we haven't figured it out yet, but they are figuring it out that how we redose or how we combine these therapies together that you've been, you've had a gene therapy either for research or an approved product. And now you're entering other research studies um, gives me hope that some of the things that we've been most concerned about um, will be solvable in the future. And it really starts to crystallize for us what these therapies look like in combination. 
Um, in FA, we've got a lot of research going on across gene therapies. We are trying to replace the frataxin gene in similar ways to what you heard about on the panel. So in vivo would be like the IV delivery. Um, ex vivo is when you take cells out of the body, you treat the cells and you give them back. And then there's gene editing where we can try and um, take the repeats out of the frataxin gene. So there are lots of different combinations here. That's what we're trying to um, depict. And we have research going on in all of them. And you heard this morning that the first gene therapy trial is now ongoing to try and treat the cardiomyopathy. Because we have so many different organ systems in FA that we are trying to treat, it is going to be that one gene therapy isn't going to treat all the symptoms of FA. It's not going to get to all the target tissues. So you're going to see therapies come forward that might treat the heart or treat the eye or try and treat the brain. And we're going to think about developing these in combination with the other therapies we're developing. There are going to be some that are going to be combination. They might include... Um, an IV administration to try and treat the heart, as well as an administration directly into the brain. But that still won't treat the whole disease. Um, and so it's complicated. And that's why we wanna to continue to kind of help you understand more and more about these therapies as they're developed. Um, all of these different orange bars are different companies or academic programs that are very active. Um, and there are some that aren't on the slide yet um, mm -hmm. because they're not ready to be shared publicly or because they're still just very, very early, but they are ongoing. But the ones that are on the bar are on this slide and have bars are programs that are actively moving forward. And Many of them are still testing in the animal models, but I think next year and the year after, you're gonna to continue to see more of these gene therapies come forward into the clinic. And they're gonna to continue to get, um, we're gonna to continue to solve some of the challenges and the problems around them as well. So with that, um, you know, I hope that you've taken home something new today that you've learned um, about FA or about some of the other conditions that we've talked about. Um, and I hope that you've met new people in our FA community. And I hope that you've found a way to continue to stay active and participate. And with that, just wanna thank you again uh, for coming. I also wanna acknowledge this year, we had over 31 speakers in this symposium. Um, And organizing this symposium of this size would not be possible without my amazing colleagues on the FARA staff. Um, yeah. Um, Jamie Dean, who has organized all of our prior symposiums is home on maternity leave with baby number three mm -hmm. in four years. Not sure how she did that with working full time. Um, and Jenna McCoy um, really pulled in and took over making sure that this symposium happened, that you were all well fed and we had a space and all that good stuff. Um, but really this planning this whole event took our whole FARA staff. Um, so for the FARA folks who are here in the room, please just stand or raise your hands, right? Um, and there are a bunch still outside, so thank you all. <laughs>